Hello and very welcome. My name is Dr. Lucas de Plessis. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Mechanical and Aeronautical Engineering at the University of Pretoria and I'm lecturing the postgraduate mod module Dynamics with the acronym MSD780. Today's lecture is number 6 and we started in lecture 5 looking at Nikravesh's application examples. Uh, today we'll continue with that. And Prof. Nikravesh, as you already know, is the author of the textbook Planar Multibody Dynamics, the second edition. As part of the textbook, he also developed, Prof. Nikravesh, a dynamic analysis program in MATLAB. And as part of his code, as his, the code that is made available, these application examples are there to, for us to study the the capabilities of the of the algorithm. So let's dive right in. The first example that we will be looking at today is the so-called card. It's explained in subsection 8.1.3 in Professor Nikravesh's textbook, Planar Multibody Dynamics, the second edition. So this model this card model as shown in figure 8.9a represents a card containing a main body and two wheels that are connected to the main body by revolute joints. So what you see on the screen is figure 8.9a. The wheels are modeled as discs rolling on the flat ground without slipping. A driver motor rotates one of the wheels causing the car to move forward and forward being uh, towards the right hand side. Okay, and what you can also see here in figure 8.9 are some of the dimensions. Um, we will look at the MATLAB input files in a minute um, which will uh, make use of these dimensions. So the individual bodies, the reference frames and the defined points are shown in figure 8.9b. Um, so here you can see the um, reference frame, the global reference frame that is fixed to the to ground. Um, what is not shown or what is not indicated here is the distance between the origin of the global reference frame and this um, point over here, uh, the shaft of this left hand side wheel, that distance is 0 0,2 meters. Um, but the other, all the other information that, that are, that's needed to define and simulate this model uh, is shown in this schematic. All right. So you can see the three bodies, body one being the cart itself, the um, local coordinate system of body one is fixed at the center of gravity and the two wheels obviously um, both of them as central centers of gravity gravities and that's where the local coordinate systems are fixed um, and then also noteworthy is the fact that we've got this point five and point six um, defined on each of these wheels and the reason for that is so that we can in the animation actually see that the wheel is rotating. If we define a point um, in the animation or in the animation input file in animate um, then the, the MATLAB code draws a line from the origin to that point okay but we'll I'll show that to you uh, in a minute now the main objective of this example this cart example is to show how to present a motor either as a driver constraint or by a torque speed function all right so in um, in this first uh, simulation of this example we will be defining um, the motor as a driver constraint. All right, so that's where we are at the moment. So in this model, in this card A model, uh, it is assumed that the rear wheel, in other words, body two, 
rolls with a constant angular velocity of 2 pi radians per second in a clockwise direction. Okay, so just to pause there for a moment, you will remember our sign convention. Counterclockwise rotations are considered to be positive and clockwise rotations are considered to be negative. Alright, so just keep that in mind. Now to enforce this condition, we employ a relative rotation constraint as the driver which refers to the function a for its analytical description and parameters. So you will remember from lecture 2 and 3 when we looked at the driven pendulum rod in a lot of detail, we also made use of function a as a driver function. So this should ring a bell. Let's look at this though from just at the details and the implementation of the driver function. And I want to refer you to subsection 7.2.8 in planar multibody dynamics revision 2. The heading of this subsection is driver constraint. A driver constraint can represent a rotary motor which is obviously what we have here and what we had for the driven pendulum rod. It can also represent a linear actuator where instead of specifying its torque or its force, we specify its kinematics as a known time function. Kinematics being either the rotation or the displacement without referring or worrying about the torque or forces that cause that motion. For a rotary motor, which is what we have here, and our rotary motor is acting about the axis of a pin joint between bodies I and J, as shown in figure 7.9a. A driver constraint can be defined as the orientation angle of body I minus the orientation angle of body J minus the driver function as a function of time equals zero. The first and second time derivatives of this function are given here by expression 7.44 and it's really trivial. The first derivative is the angular velocity of body I minus the angular velocity of body J minus the time derivative of the driving function is zero. And the second time derivative is similar. The angular acceleration of body I minus the angular acceleration of body j minus the second time derivative of the driver function equals zero. Now in, all, in our model, bodies i and j are two, bodies two and one respectively. Body i is body two, the rear wheel, okay, as you can see here, and body j is body 1, the frame of the card. Okay, so our, we can then, in other words, substitute, and you'll see that in a minute, we can substitute the orientation angle of body 2 wherever we have in our equations phi i, and we can substitute the orientation of body 1 wherever we have phi j, and similar for the angular velocities and angular accelerations. Okay, so I've mentioned the dynamic analysis program type A function. Okay, and this is also, as I said earlier, what we've used for the driven pendulum rod. Now let's just see how we are going to specify this constant angular velocity of body 2 of 2 pi radians per second clockwise how are we going to specify that using this type A function in the dynamic analysis program? The general expression for this function is given here by expression equation 8.1. F equals C1 plus C2t plus C3t squared. Now let's first, we now need to calculate the coefficients C1, C2 and C3 and that those coefficients will get specified inside the dynamic analysis program input files. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. 
for now let's just calculate the values of these coefficients so we start with coefficient c1 at time t0 we've defined the orientation of body 2 as 0 how did we do that if we look at this exploded view of the assembly you will see that the local axis c 2 that this is the local C axis of body 2 this axis is parallel to the global x axis so in other words the orientation of body 2 at time t0 is 0 okay because there's no angle difference between these two axes they are parallel right, so that's why i'm saying we've defined phi 2 at time t0 as 0 now for the main frame of the cart, its orientation will remain zero, not only at time t zero, but as the cart moves, the orientation of the main frame does not change. The main chassis or main frame of this cart does not change. It remains in this orientation. And the orientation as for body two at time t zero, the local C1 axis is parallel to the global x-axis there's no angular difference between those two axes so its orientation the orientation of body one is zero and it remains zero that's what i'm saying here okay so now looking at the driver constraint function if uh, sorry this is this equation or this driver function that we spoke about earlier and we reshuffle the terms and we substitute phi 2 as phi i and phi 1 as phi j. We can write down this equation over here. f as a function of t equals phi 2 minus phi 1. And we just noted that at time t 0, phi 2 and phi 1 um, both are 0. So substituting the zeros, it's easy to see that at time t0, ft is 0. And then we substitute all the zeros, including this f at time t0 equals 0, into equation 8.1. So we've got 0 equals c1 plus c2 times 0 plus c3 times 0 squared. So all those zeros, and we simplify, it's easy to see that the coefficient c1 must be zero let's now co calculate the coefficient c3 we know that the angular acceleration of body 2 is zero it is zero at time instant naught and all subsequent time instants why do we know that because as we said here the rear wheel body 2 rolls with a constant angular velocity constant angular velocity means there is no angular acceleration so that's why we can say the angular acceleration of body 2 equals 0 similarly we know that the orientation angle of body 1 does not change it remains parallel to the ground so we can say that the angular acceleration of this body 1 is also 0 now looking at equation 744, the second part of this equation, we and reshuffling the terms and substituting these zeros, we get that the angular, the second time derivative of the driver function must be zero. Now the second time derivative of equation 8.1 is 2c3. How did I get that? We took the first time derivative f dot equals c2 plus 2c3 times t hence f double dot is 2c3 now we just calculated that f double dot as a function of t is zero so it follows that c3 must also be zero and finally let's calculate the coefficient c2 so the time derivative of equation 8.1 i just mentioned it is f dot as a function of t is c2 
plus 2C3T. But C3 is 0. We just calculated that. Hence, F dot as a function of time is equal to C2. Okay. Now looking at equation 744, the left hand side of this equation, and reshuffling the terms, we can see that F dot as a function of time is the angular velocity of body 2 minus the angular velocity of body 1. And if we then substitute that, we know that the angular velocity of body 2 is minus 2 pi radians per second. Minus 2 pi because body 2 is rotating in a clockwise direction. We know the angular velocity of body 1 is 0. Why? Because body 1, the main frame of the car, remains its orientation, doesn't change as this car moves. So, um, we've got that the we we've got the equation then that f dot as a function of time is minus two pi, and we just said that f dot as a function of time is c two, so it follows that c two is minus two pi. So we've got all three coefficients, and in a little bit I'll show you where we substitute these values inside the uh, input MATLAB files for the dynamic analysis program. So now we're ready to look at um, exercise 8.6. Um, it asks us to review the input M files for this model and note that the initial velocities are all zero. And I'll refer back to this last statement in a little bit. Okay, so let's quickly look at the input of MATLAB files. The first one is in animate um, and there we specify these two points that I referred to earlier, 0.5 and 0.6. So um, the definition is straightforward. P5 is a point, is a structure with the name point struct. It is on body 2 as you can see here. And it is at local coordinates 0, 0,1 and 0. The C component 0, 0,1 and the eta component 0. Okay. So we immediately know that the radius of the wheel is 0, 0,1. Now the same goes for point P6. Um, it, the only difference is it is on body 3. But the local coordinates or the local coordinates are the same as that of 0.5 in body 2. So then we list um, points anim consisting of P5 and P6. The other important thing to look at is um, these additional specifications to bodies 1, 2 and 3. So to explain that I want to refer us to the user manual that Professor Nikravesh wrote for his body coordinate formulation dynamic analysis program. And there are two files that I want to just um, elaborate on. The first is in animate, which you can see on the right hand side here, and you are very well familiar with it. So, um, as per the user manual, Additional points or outlines for improving the presentation of an animation can be specified, but these points or outlines are not required for the analysis. Now, in this file, in the inanimate file, we may provide data for shape and color of bodies, additional points for better visualization, and plot parameters. Okay, so the plot parameters... We are very well familiar with that and we've also looked at additional points a number of times. But now I just want to emphasize and explain these additional shapes and colors for the bodies that we can also specify. So there's no new structure associated with the inanimate file. We use the existing structures of bodies and points. Okay, points, as I said already, we're familiar with. Um, we use the additional 
or we use the existing body's structure to specify the shapes and colors of the animation um, figures. Now we've already looked at examples where additional points anim have been specified, right? So I'm not going to elaborate again on that. Um, we may choose a shape, okay, as is done here for bodies 1, 2, and 3. Um, these shapes are shown in, uh, these are not the complete list, but uh, the complete list of all the shapes that can be specified for a body are shown here in figure 8 point or B9 rather. Okay, so we've got a rectangle, a, a circle and a line, either horizontal or vertical. Now for any of these shapes, the program assumes that the geometric center of the shape is the origin of the Cassi eta frame which is also the origin of the mass center. Okay, and this is our convention. Uh, if you remember, we, in, in specifying the location or selecting the location of the Cassi eta frame, it is good practice to select that frame to coincide with the mass center of the body. Now, for the animation, what we're saying here is when, when you choose to, or when you represent the body with one of these shapes, uh, it, will, it will fit in nicely with our convention in the sense that the geometric center of the shape is then also placed at the um, origin of the Cassi eta reference frame um, uh, of the body. All right. Now, the data for a shape is saved in additional fields in the body structure. We already mentioned that. And um, this is explained here in table B.8. Okay, so for a rectangle, okay, and this is what we have here. Body 1, in our example, is a rectangle. We specify it as with the letters R, E, C, T, an abbreviation for rectangle. We need to specify the width and the height. Okay. Um, those are the minimum requirements. Okay. And I'll get come back to the color in a little bit. Right. The color is universal for any shape. Okay. For, but the minimum requirements for a rectangle is obviously the definition or the name of the rectangle. Or the name rectangle. R-E-C-T. The width and the height. The minimum requirements for a circle, uh, you, you specify the shape, the circular shape with the word circle, and you need to add the radius of the circle. Now, for Octave, as you know, I'm using Octave, I'm not using MATLAB. Uh, for Octave, if you want to specify, or you have to specify the radius um, as a, this is a row vector, okay, so in square brackets and you specify the radius twice, you have to do that, if you don't do that and you try to animate your, um, your uh, simulation, you will get an error message, right, so you have to do that, um, uh, and yeah, so obviously, and I've already mentioned it before, the radius for these um, for these wheels uh, is 0 0.1 meter. So, I mean, that we, we uh, mentioned when we talked about these points 5 and 6. So, um, it's no surprise that bodies 2 and 3, the shape is circles or circular, and the radius is 0 0.1. But once again, you have to list it twice, otherwise you get an error message. Okay, so that is um, our uh, input file in Animate. Okay, we still have to talk about color, 
So let's just look at the program anim, which is the program that we call when we type in the word anim, the abbreviation for animation. Okay, let's just quickly look at that. Now, the program anim displays the body mass centers and all the defined points as small circles. Okay, this, this is something we, we know from our previous animations and simulations. The program draws lines between the mass center and every point that is defined on that body. Okay, so every point. So if you in, um, in your input file in points define a point on body 1 in, and you run the animation, the animation is going to draw a line from the mass center of body 1 to that point P1. Okay? The same goes for the points that you specify in the input file in animate. Okay? If you specify a point on body 2, um, the animation is going to draw a line from the mass center of body 2 to this point P5 on body 2. All right. The assigned color to a body will be used for the lines as well. For the lines that we just spoke about. And the default color is black. Now we can specify a different color based on MATLAB's color abbreviations. And you're welcome to Google the MATLAB color abbreviations. Um, in this case, for our card, we specify R, and I think that's red, for the rectangle associated with body 1. And um, the wheels, we haven't specified any color, so those wheels will be black. All right. So that's um, the program anim. Let's look at the input file in bodies. Um, there are three bodies as we already know. For body 1 the mass is given as 20 kilograms and the moment of inertia 5 kilogram meter squared. This isn't specified in the example, it's pre-populated in the input file. Now let's just talk about the position, the initial position of body 1. Now I mentioned earlier that the distance between the global coordinate system and this point 3 on body 2 is 0 0,2 meters. Okay, so how did I get to that? Now remember this figure 8.9b is an exploded view in, the, in figure 8.9a the assembled view is shown. So we know that point 1 here indicated here in square brackets and point 3 indicated on, on, in square brackets. Those points coincide in the assembled view. All right. Now we also know that the global coordinate system is fixed here on ground. If we look at the exploded view uh, and we interpolate it in the assembled view, the global coordinate system is fixed on ground. So, looking now at the initial position of body 1, we can see that the x coordinate is 0 0,5 meters. So, this distance is 0 0,3. So, it follows then that the distance from the shaft of the wheel and the origin of the global coordinate system is 0 0,2 meters. 0 0,5 minus 0 0,3 is 0 0,2. This distance is 0 0,2 meters. All right. Uh, the initial orientation of body 1 is obviously 0. Um, this is, if you recall, this is the angle between the local C axis and the global X axis. And you can clearly see that these two axes are parallel, so the angle between them is zero. Now, let's quickly look at body 2. 
Body 2's mass is 2 kilograms. Moment of inertia 0,5 kilogram meter squared. The initial position of body 2 is then 0,2 in the x direction and 0,1 in the y direction. Okay, that 0,1 in the y direction follows from figure 8.9a. The 0,2 in the x direction is something we explained uh, a minute ago. Um, let me just quickly go back to body one initial body one's initial y uh, position or coordinate that is 0, 0,2. Okay, and that also follows from figure 8.9a. All right. Now body three very simple. The mass and moment of inertia is the same as that of body two. Two kilograms mass and 0 0.5 kilogram meter square moment of inertia now the initial position of body 3 is then that 0 0.2 that we spoke about for body 1 and body 2 so 0 0.2 plus 0 0.3 is 0 0.5 plus 0 0.3 is 0 0.8 that's where this 0 0.8 comes from the initial y coordinate is 0, 0,1. This follows from the dimension given here in figure 8.9a. The initial orientation of both body 1 and, oh sorry, body 3 and body 2, those initial orientations are both 0. Right. Then we just list all three bodies, and that uh, that is all that we need to specify for in bodies. I'm quickly going to skip in funks. I'll get back to that in a minute. Let's quickly look at in joints. All right, so um, joint J1 is a revolute joint. Point I is point 1. Okay. And point J is point 3, which makes sense. I mentioned that before in the exploded view, points 1 and 3 are separated, but in the assembled view, they obviously coincide. So, and that's a revolute joint. Nothing strange there. Let's look at joint 2. Uh, also a revolute joint. Point I is point 2, which is on body 1. And point J is point 4, which is on body 3. Okay, once again, nothing strange there. We can quickly just um, look at the specification of points 1, 2, 3, and 4. Right? Um, so, you can, you can actually see that in this exploded view, but... Um, it is specified here as well. So point 1 is on body 1 at local coordinates minus 0, 0,3 minus 0, 0,1. Okay, that follows from the dimensions shown here in figure 8.9a. Now point 2, point 2 which is this point over here is also on body 1 and it is at local coordinates 0, 0,3 in the positive C direction and also minus 0, 0,1 in the uh, eta direction. Point 3 is on body 2. It is at the center of gravity, which is where the local C2, eta 2 coordinate system is fixed. So the local coordinates of point 3 on body 2 is 0 or R 0, 0. And the same goes for point 4 um, on body 3. It also coincides with the center of gravity, which is where the local C4, eta 4 coordinate system is, origin, uh, is positioned. So the local coordinates of point 4 on body 3 are 0, 0. So, Joint J3 is what is referred to as a circular disk. We define this 
joint using the word disc, the abbreviation disc for circular disc. The body index is body 2. So we're talking about the, this wheel, the rear wheel if you like. Um, the radius is defined as 0, 0,1 which we know and we also define x0, the initial x coordinate of the center of gravity of that disk and as you know um, that distance is 0, 0,2 meters now um, the same definition is used for um, the circular disk or the front wheel it's also a disk body index is 3 radius is 0, 0,1 and the initial x position of that center of gravity of body 3 is 0, 0,8 meters we know that already um, and then you can specify a unique angle if the angle is zero, you don't need to specify that because that is in any case the default. So that's why for joint three, no initial angle is specified. So the default will be used. But for uh, joint four, just for completeness sake, we specify the initial angle um, as zero. That's the initial orientation angle of that body, which is zero. Okay. So let's just look at how that is, why the this joint is formulated the way it is, and in order to do so, uh, we will refer to subsection 7.2.7 .7 in uh, planar multibody dynamics, circular disc. So a rigid circular disc rolling on a flat surface, as shown in Figure 7.8a could represent a wheel rolling on, on the ground. It could also represent a gear rolling on a rack. Okay, there's no slip, in other words. So here you can see figure 7.8a on the screen. Now to ensure that the disc remains in contact with the ground, a constraint such as y, the y coordinate of body i, minus the radius of the disc, equals zero where r i is the radius of the disk is defined okay and this is done automatically and this is also the reason why we specify the radius of the disk as you can see here for joint three as well as for joint four okay so now to understand that a little bit better let's refer to subsection 7.2.6 simple constraints a simple constraint is a condition imposed on one or more coordinates of the body for example and this is exactly what we have for the uh, circular disc for and this is another example you could specify the y coordinate of a typical body i must remain equal to 0 0.25 meters we write the simple constraint as y subscript i minus 0, 0.25 equals 0. Now since the body has three coordinates, any of the following simple constraints can be imposed on a body. And this is given by equation 738. So we can have a, a, a constant C1, C2 and C3 um, and we can specify those constant values for uh, the x, y, or the phi coordinate. x and y being position coordinates, phi being the orientation of a body. Now the velocity and acceleration constraints for these simple constraints have trivial forms which yield the Jacobian matrix for each of those uh, representative simple constraints as well as the right hand side being zero for each of those, the right hand side of the acceleration equations. So with the Jacobian matrix known and the right hand side of the acceleration known, we can solve the equations of motion. Okay, and as you can see here, there's nothing special needed to be defined inside the um, any of the input files in order to derive the Jacobian matrix. 
or the right hand side. This is trivial. This is const these are constant values, so they they are hard coded inside the algorithm. Okay, all we need to specify is the is the constant um, for that specific simple constraint. And that was done here by specifying the radius of the disk. That is in our case of a circular disk the value of the constant. Alright. Okay, so that's simple constraints. Now to ensure that the disk rolls without slipping, a constraint for non no slip must be enforced. Right, so how is that done? The no slip condition can be viewed as a relationship between the rotational and translational velocities of the disk. And that's given by this expression over here. The radius of the disk multiplied by the angular velocity equals minus the x coordinate or the x velocity rather. Okay, so why is it minus? We note that the disk rolls counterclockwise, so that's why we have a positive phi dot i, and if it does so, it translates to the left, which is a negative x dot, and that's why we have this equation here, r subscript phi, sorry, r subscript i multiplied by the angular velocity, the radius multiplied by the angular velocity, which is now counterclockwise, will yield a movement at, or a translation towards the left, which is the negative x direction. That's where this equation comes from. So the integral of this relationship provides the position constraint for the no-slip condition as. Okay, so we write down the radius of the disk equals the, or multiplied by the orientation angle of body i minus the initial orientation of body i plus the x the in, the x coordinate of body i minus the initial x coordinate of body i equals zero okay that's the integral of this equation over here where superscript zero x i and superscript zero phi i are the initial x and phi coordinates of the disk now the corresponding Jacobian matrix and right hand side of the acceleration constraint are then the Jacobian is given by this equation here 1 0 r i and the right hand side of the acceleration is simply 0 ok so this radius that we've specified here and that we've used in the simple constraint is then also used in the Jacobian matrix for um, the non-slip condition that we want to enforce. Okay, so that's uh, straightforward. And then also what we also need to know uh, or need to emphasize is the initial x coordinates of the two disks. So that's used in the constraint equation uh, 740. We have the initial x coordinate of the disk. Plus, if you have a unique initial orientation you can specify that here as well and that's used here in equation 740 um, for the initial orientation of the disk so joint j5 is a relative rotational joint that's the motor driver if you remember lectures 3 and 4 where we spoke about the driven pendulum rod we also defined a relative rotation joint uh, when we wanted to specify the, the angular rotation of that pendulum rod, which is exactly what we want to do here. Okay, so let's just quickly look. Body, the body I is body 2. That's our uh, driving wheel, in other words. Body 2. And uh, body J is body 1. Yes, that makes sense. Um, and the function is function number one. All right. So we will look at in functions in a minute. Those are the five joints that we define and that we list here in uh, this variable joints. 
Right, so let's quickly look at in funks, and we already spoke about the um, uh, the three coefficients for this a type function that you need to specify. The first coefficient being zero, as well as the third coefficient, and the second coefficient being minus two pi. If you remember, we spoke about that um, a wheel a while ago. Right, so that's in funks in joints. In points we already spoke about, there are no U vectors. So we are almost ready to run the simulation. Before we do, I just want to emphasize here um, that the initial velocities for the three bodies are all zeros. How do we know that? If we look at the input file in bodies, there are no initial velocities specified. Hence the default zero velocity zero velocity components are used for each of the three bodies zero x velocity zero y velocity zero angular velocity those are the default values if we don't specify anything different that the, the simulation program uses all right so uh, note note please note that okay let's now run the simulation in order to do that we enter the word DAP, which is an acronym for, or the letters DAP, an acronym for Dynamic Analysis Program, which model contains, or which folder contains the model, and that is card subscript A. Do you want to correct the initial conditions? Yes, we do want to correct the initial conditions. And now, you will note the the coordinates are exactly as we've entered it, x for body 1, y for body 1, x and phi, etc., x for body 2, y, etc., exactly as we've entered it, so there were no correction needed. But the velocities, even though we've specified zero velocities indirectly by not specifying any uh, velocities as such, here you can see the x velocity of the three bodies is 0 0.628. Those are the corrected velocities. And the angular velocities for bodies 2 and 3 are 2 minus 2 pi. Um, yes, which is correct. Those, those bodies rotate at a constant angular velocity of minus 2 pi radians per second in other words 2 pi radians per second clockwise right now let's specify the final time 1 reporting time step let's make that 0 comma 1 and then we run the animation we type in the words or the letters a n i m abbreviation for animation Okay, so let's just quickly have a look now at our input file in animate. And now you can see that uh, body 1, the rectangle is drawn as specified with the parameter W as 0, 0,9. This is the length of the rectangle. The parameter H is 0, 0,2. Um, and the color is indeed red. Um, at the beginning of the lecture I wasn't sure, but R is indeed red. And then what you can also see, remember, for um, in points. We had point P1 and point P2 on that body, alright? So point P1 being at local coordinates minus comma 3, minus comma 1, and point P2 being at local coordinates 0, 0,3 plus minus 0, 0,1. So this is now, this shows you, these red lines show you that the animation function or program creates the rectangle and draws a line between the center of gravity of body 1 and each of the points that you specify. Now, the same is, is done for points P3 and 
on body 2 and point P4 on body 3. Okay, but you can't see you can't see the line that has been drawn in okay because it overlaps now with this red line but the minute it starts moving you will see that black line from the center of um, uh, body 2 the center of gravity to point P3 and the same for uh, point P4 uh, the line that's drawn in from the center of gravity of body 3 to point P4. Okay. Um, Alright, so I think enough said. Let's run the animation. Uh, it's asking us for, to press any key to continue. So looking at the animation that just played, it was clear that the wheels rotated as expected. Um, the black line emanating from the center of gravity of the wheel to the edge of the wheel incremented as it rotated. The other thing that we've noticed is that the wheels completed exactly one full revolution, which equals two pi radians. And this ties up with the stipulated uh, angular velocity for the rear wheel which was, if you remember, 2 pi radians per second. I'm just going to play the animation again, if you want to have a look. So let's now look at the solution as presented in Nikravesh's Planar Multibody Dynamics. We first note that since the angular velocity of the wheel is minus 2 pi radians per second at time t equals 0, we need to provide correct initial velocities for all three bodies or ask the program to correct them for us. Okay, and this is what we've done. We've asked the program to correct the initial conditions for us. Now, when you ask the program, to correct the initial conditions, you receive the values as follows. Okay, and this is shown here on the left hand side as well as on the right hand side here in our Octave command window. Now we note that the corrected coordinates are exactly as specified. No corrections had to be made and no corrections were made. Okay, these are the exact values that we entered in the uh, in body's input file but the corrected vol velocities have been updated okay if you remember in in bodies we we did not specify any initial velocities hence the program assumed that we wanted to specify zero initial velocities we asked the program to then correct the initial conditions and it did so with the initial velocities. So the x velocities of bodies 1, 2 and 3 are exactly the same. And if you do the analytical calculation, um, velocity equals radius times angular velocity in radians, you will get to this answer here. Because the radius is 0 0,1 meter, the angular velocity is 2 pi radians per second. So this is 0 0.62832, which is 0 0.1 times 2 pi. That's for body 1, 2, and 3. The y velocities for bodies 1, 2, and 3 are exactly equal to 0. And the angular velocity of body 1 is 0. If you remember, body 1 is the frame. It does not change orientation, hence the angular velocity is zero. And the angular velocities of bodies uh, two and three are minus two pi each. Uh, minus two pi, why? Because it's rotating in a clockwise manner. Okay, so this ties up with what is in the textbook. This ties up with what the analysis program did. Okay, so that was exercise 8.6. Let's now look at exercise 8.7.
It asks us to execute DAP, but do not ask the program to correct the initial conditions. That is, keep all initial velocities at zero. So let's quickly do that. We clear the workspace, we clear the command window, and we execute DAP. It is still card A. Do you want to correct the initial conditions? Now we say no. And here you can see there's a warning, there's a redundancy in the constraints. Okay, and but we'll look at the uh, post mortem in a little bit. Okay, let's first enter the final time as one second, the reporting time step as 0, 0,1. Okay, um, then exercise 8.7 asks us to perform an animation of the response. We need to observe what is happening and then we need to clarify why that is happening so let's quickly do that Now you notice that the cart did not move, okay? It did not move, it remained stationary. The question is, why did that happen? To answer that question, let's look at the solution provided by Prof. Nikravesh in his Planar Multibody Dynamics textbook. We observe that nothing moves, even though we have a driver stating that the angular velocity of body 2 is minus 2 pi radians per second. Why? The reason is that when we solve the equations of motion, we only enforce the second time derivative of the constraints, including the driver constraint. Those are the things that we enforce. Okay, so to, to look at that, let's just refer back to what we discussed and summarized in lecture 4. Uh, you will remember and you will recognize these equations as the position constraint, velocity constraints, and acceleration constraints, that's equation 13, 19, 20 and 21, as well as the equations of motion, 13, 22. So what we're saying here is that in solving the equations of motion, 13, 22, uh, we only enforce the acceleration constraints, 13, 21, as well as the driver constraint. We are not enforcing 13, 19, and 1320. Why are we not enforcing it? Because when we when we ran the simulation and the program asked us if we wanted to correct the initial conditions, initial positions, initial velocities, we said no. So we are not enforcing those equations. Yet, the second time derivative of our driver constraint enforces that the angular acceleration of body 2 must be equal to zero. So, if we start the simulation with zero angular velocity, which is indeed what we did, all right? If you remember in the MATLAB file in bodies, we didn't specify any initial velocities. So the default value that the simulation program uses um, are zero initial velocities. That's what we specified. We also then said, don't correct the initial conditions, don't correct the initial velocities. So those zero velocities are what is used then to solve the equations of motion. So we start with zero velocities. The driver acceleration stipulates that the angular acceleration of body 2 must be zero. So our... Uh, our velocities will remain unchanged at zero, which is exactly what we saw in the animation, which is a representation of what the simulation did. The simulation solved the equations of motion. The cart remained stationary. It did not move. And this is the reason why. Our initial velocities were stipulated as zero, stipulated indirectly as zero, and we enforced a driver constraint 
we stipulated that the angular acceleration must be zero. So the cart cannot move. This absolutely makes sense. And this was quite a long discussion of our first cart example. In our next lecture, we will look at instead of having a driver constraint, we will uh, represent a motor using a torque speed function. So thank you very much for watching.